Well, here, here's your story. Tell the story of our team. All right, thank you. All right. So we've done this project for like six years or so, and we didn't do it last year. I missed it. Um, last uh, two years ago, we actually did it at the Big Picture Theater. It's been really cool. But um, anyway, uh, this is not an easy project. There's a lot to it. You have to pick someone to interview. You have to actually reach out and like, you know, step outside your comfort zone. You got to schedule, you got to interview, you got to record, you got to edit. There's a lot there. So if you think it was easy, it's probably because you built a kind of foundational skill before you got there. Um, so you should all be proud that you completed the project. We'll have a round of applause for everyone. Sorry. If we could, we show all of them. Uh, we're showing 11. Uh, we chose these 11. Uh, and again, we could have chosen uh, a lot of them. Uh, we chose 11 because we're limited by time, and we believe that these 11 um, represent this school, this project, and this community pretty well. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's why we chose them. So none of you should feel bad if you're not chosen. Uh, just as a quick reminder, I know this was like two months ago that we introduced this project. I just want to really, really quickly say what the project was. It's the Ethnography Project. Ethnography is the study and systematic recording of human cultures and history. This year's theme was sustenance, the things that keep us going. Food, drink, and that's what it's not physically, it's also like our economy and our society. Your job was step one to choose a topic. You all chose your own topic. Step two, find someone to interview, someone you knew or someone who knows someone you know. Step three, Yuma. Conduct your field work. This is the one that took a lot, um, probably the longest because you actually had to like schedule it and show up and an in interview and walk around and get B-roll. And then step four, which probably took longer than you thought it was going to take, edit. I thought you had to do the last All right. So, 11 of you are going to share your project today. Congratulations to you, 11, although congratulations to all. And we're going to start with Karen. Can I say one thing? Real quick? Sure. So, the thing, I, the thing that I want to say, it re restates partly what Mr. Gordon just said, which is that we're going to see a few 11 uh, projects today, but we're really celebrating all the projects and all the work that you did. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. This is really all us together celebrating all your work because we really are very proud of what everyone did. And I, I just wanted to also add that for me, as the English teacher side of it, I think you all should notice that two really cool things about this project were that you're producing media in a form that is much more contemporary and relevant to you and your life, if you think about it, than schoolwork used to be or typically is in an English class, for example. I didn't ask you to do a research paper on broccoli or uh, on farming. You're creating in a format with, with uh, audio recording and video that's much more common for you for what you like to watch. And the other thing that's really cool is that you all chose these, you really narrowed these topics and chose them for yourself. We gave you just that bit of guidance to say food is a really great topic. It connects all of us and it's important to all of us. But from there, every one of your topics really came from you and is driven by your interests. So I think those are really great things to remember and celebrate about this about this project that we're working on. Yes, Karen. I was trying to stall so you had time to walk up. Oh, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. To step up, stand to the microphone, right? Okay. <laughs> Do you want to just tell us who you are, who you chose, and why you picked it? Um, I'm Karen. Um, I chose the sweet spot because, well, um, <laughs> I don't know. It's always been like kind of a go to for me, and I've been very into like. Uh, 
you know, if you're having a bad day and like a, a chocolate chip cookie can bring a smile to your face, then it's, it's, it's a connection, you know? When growing up, everyone in my family would always be in the kitchen. We would always just hang out. Nobody was hanging out in the living room. We were all just like in the kitchen together. At a young age, I was um, always like making stuff. I'm a maker. And then when I was in high school, we had a great art program, and um, I knew that I wanted to go to art school. Johnny and I are both glass blowers, glass workers, and so we were home all the time. We have a studio at home, and we started having chickens and raising chickens and um, a bunch of different other things, and um, and a huge garden. And when we had all the chickens, we were like, "What could we make that's a value-added product?" out of all these eggs, like we're not gonna eat them all. So Johnny started messing around with ice cream and we bought a couple like commercial ice cream makers. And we also um, started selling ice cream at the farmer's market. Johnny would ride his bike with a freezer attached to it, like a little trailer freezer and, and pedal over there and scoop ice cream. Um, this place was like demolished. I mean, there's a water line on the side of the building that is not actually accurate. Um, the water line was like up to the windows, um, you know, of this building. So uh, there was like a lot of destruction. The whole interior had to be redone. The whole foundation of this building had to be redone. The little building that was next to it like crashed into um, this building. Like there's a lot that happened there. Um, the bridge got um, hurt by it. So. Um, so after that, it was like, let's just all come together. When we, we set up a huge table down the middle of Bridge Street and took the contents out of all of the buildings on Bridge Street and like washed everything and cleaned everything that was salvageable. Um, so because nobody had like, you couldn't do anything inside because it was gross. And people were just coming with their own buckets and like taking buckets of water out of the basements of all the buildings and just kind of just rolling up their sleeves and getting dirty so you know you really see how people react to things like that in in a small town and for me it was like the most eye-opening thing like people that don't know each other or um, never met or have different opinions on things all come together and nothing matters except that um, that thing like except that that emergency that people need to come together and, and and take over and figure out how to deal with to me like living in a place like this where people really come together from all walks of life um, is is like the heartbeat of our community I talked to Andy, my mom, about the small piece she did this in the barn lot because um, every time we deliver pieces to the before market, and um, like when people pick up pieces, that's just like the joy on their face brings me joy, and I want to learn more about it, so how it started and kind of how my family has been a part of it. Yeah. <laughs> oh hi, my name is Yuko Cormier and I have a small sushi business called Wildflower Sushi. Hi, my name is Yuma Cormier and the other day I interviewed my mom Yuko Cormier about her small sushi business in the Mad River Valley. First of all, Sushi was not something my mother made at home. Sushi was something that I, you know, we, in, in Japan, sushi is something you take out or you go out uh, to eat. 
So my mother's influence, if you talk about that, well, definitely、uh, the quality of good rice, which rice to choose to cook, and also, no, it's just the way that you put your love into your cooking. Some of the、um, memorable, and also, the, I would say milestones. Of my sushi business is that the、uh, my children got involved in the sushi business. But Naomi, your oldest sister, but she、um, learned how to make sushi、um, and from me, and um, um, she has、um, you know while I was away to Japan, she made sushi and、um, you know delivered to the market and. Made it her business for a while. Enzo, also, he made onigiris and discovered, or in, you know, well, like kind of、um, invented his own flavor using tuna and spices, and、um, he was pretty successful in that. Kaya, my second youngest daughter, she、um, has been. She has learned how to make sushi as well. And we did、um, make sushi during the summer, this past summer, which was a lot of fun. And I think my youngest one is interested, and he would be making sushi with me sooner or later.、Um, su- making sushi really does,、um, it is my. I consider it as my meditation. Often I make sushi early in the morning, getting up by 4:30 and get it started. It's very、uh, medicinal. My mom plans to keep her sushi business going for as long as she can, and one day I may make sushi too. Have you ever wondered about the people who took the photos of the tasty-looking food in magazines and on websites? Well, my mom, Tina Pease, is a food photographer, and I'll be interviewing her about food photography. I am self-taught with food photography.
photography. So experience to have on my resume. Have you ever wondered about the people who took the photos of the tasty looking food in magazines and on websites? Well, my mom, Tina Pease, is a food photographer, and I'll be interviewing her about food photography. I am self-taught with food photography, so I had always just had cameras around growing up, and my mom always had a film camera, so growing up I always used analog film cameras and just played with cameras a lot and loved taking film photos and getting them developed and it was always just a hobby and then i went to fashion school so i was more involved with fashion styling and retail work so after years of doing different creative work artwork fashion work retail work i moved to florida from boston i grew up in the boston area moved to Florida and that's where my daughter was born, Harmony. And at the time I was working on a farm in Florida and while I was pregnant with her. So that was the beginning of my food journey where I started to get really involved with wanting to know more about where my food was coming from and how it affected our health. And then we moved to Santa Cruz, California, where I had a lot of farmer friends and started cooking a lot of different types of food like gluten-free and vegetarian meals and just learning a lot about different types of food and then we moved to Brooklyn, New York where I was really inspired by the food around me because there were so many different cultures and just amazing food and that's where I began my food blog. So I started food blogging for myself at home while I was raising my daughter and I was a stay-at-home mom with her and so I was doing just creative work on my own and growing in my photography skills and styling skills on my own at home and then we moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts where I had my first food photography job and so I began working with lots of different restaurants and chefs and different products that would send me product to style and photograph for them. So one of my first jobs that I ever had in Boston was working for a company called Caviar, which was an online delivery company of food, which led to me just working with a lot of different chefs and restaurants. I did photos at a juice bar, and several months after that, the chef there contacted me to help her with her plant-based cookbook. The cookbook is called The Plant-Based Gourmet by Chef Susie Gerber, and it's all plant-based, all vegan and just a beautiful set of recipes, like over a hundred recipes, I believe. And it was a lot of work and a great experience to have on my resume. So working for myself and being completely self-employed means that I run every aspect of my business. So aside from just being an artist and someone who takes the photos, I have to run every part of being basically an entrepreneur. So that means that I need to prospect clients. That means I'm finding different products and different companies or restaurants or chefs that need photos just for their online social media campaigns, for their websites, for their menus. And so that's me making connections with people in the industry that need my work. So a lot more work is put into having to set up all of the boots and scheduling and all of the budgeting, finances, equipment updates, lighting, computer updates, keeping my website updated, creating invoices for them. So freelancing can be really fun because I get to work from home on my own schedule and make my own schedule for myself without other people's expectations on me necessarily, where I get to also tell them what I can do when I can do it, but also 
it can be difficult because I'm needing to balance and manage my own time living and being at home and also working from home. So generally, I really like styling a lot of food that is plant-based because I eat a mostly plant-based diet. So my favorite things to style are anything that has to do with a lot of bright, vibrant plants and herbs. So that brings a lot of natural color in without needing to do a lot to the food or the photo. I think doing food photography and just being a creative in general using our talents and skills in order to help our communities through whatever they might need. So helping other small businesses to grow through my creativity and skills that they may not have the time to work on or do while they're running their business and creating their food. So using those skills to help them to grow and to help them to get more noticed through my social media and just interviewing and talking with different food companies and helping their brands to be seen more in the public eye. So one last thing that I'd like to say about food photography or any creative work that you're doing is that play becomes a really important part of it for me and just having the downtime to get used to the medium that you're working with. So any type of materials that you're using in your artwork or creative work, just enjoying that medium. For me, I love foraging, so getting involved with like mushrooms and plants and finding things in the forest is part of the play part of it for me, and then I can bring those things into the work that I'm doing by using those as props, as well as I got into pottery for a while because those props help to accompany my photos and help them to be more enhanced. So Great. playing and enjoying what you're doing really adds to your work and people seeing that you enjoy it. I have actually a great job in that I get to do lots of different things and that's maybe the part that I like best. So some, in a way, I had self-defined different job descriptions, but in the end I realized that I could boil it down to two words, be helpful. If I could come into work each day and in some way be helpful to the people who work here or to the people who are our customers or to the community or to the environment then I would feel like I had done my job. I was in fifth grade I wrote a little paper and that said that I wanted to be a professional baseball player and uh, I ended up never doing that of course but I did get involved with um, athletics so uh, I was on the varsity soccer team and tr track team and both in high school and college. And so I had a kind of physical or active life that 
has actually helped my work here, which um, has a very physical component. Baking is physical, and certainly now as I've transitioned more into the gardening work, that is very physical. And I find that that work is health affirming. I came to the Mad River Valley in late 1979 and as a ski bum, thinking that I'd be here for four or five months and that I would get back to my career of in the biological sciences, which is where I had worked for about nine years. And uh, there weren't any jobs for biologists, so I got a job washing dishes. And a couple of weeks into that, the chef said, well, do you want to learn how to use a knife? And I thought to myself, well, I already know how to wash dishes. I might as well learn something else before I leave this place. So I said, sure. And that started this unlikely apprenticeship in the culinary arts out of which Five years later, I developed American flatbread, which became my life's work. Um, so the first flatbread I baked was in 1985, and we started doing it in a restaurant format in 1987, and then we started making a frozen version in 1990. And as the frozen work was expanding, I realized that there just wasn't room to grow that business over at Tucker Hill Lodge where I had been working. So a friend recommended that I speak with the owners here at Laurel Farm. Um, they agreed to lease me some space. We built an oven and so I leased here for 10 years and then in 2001 had an opportunity to buy the farm and I thought that that would be helpful in terms of securing a long-term home for American flatbread. So I'm Emily and I chose to interview my aunt Cheryl Davis because she's diving in a lot of different kinds of food and a lot of different diets. And I was wondering how it affected her, what she learned from it. And she's a really fun person, so I had a lot of fun doing the interview and the people and stuff. So hopefully you enjoy. I'm going to talk to I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk to my aunt Sherry. I'm going to talk to my aunt Cheryl about uh, her eating habits. A while ago she changed the way she ate to eating healthier and I'm wondering why did you do that? Hi, I am Cheryl. I did that because I wasn't feeling very good about my diet. I was eating a lot of sugar and a lot of simple carbs and I was exhausted. I ate less sugar and I'm eating a lot more fruits and vegetables and more complex carbs and like no um, simple carbs. It's always a journey, <laughs> food and dieting and eating, and 
I've tried lots of different things. I've tried something called the Ayurvedic diet, which has a lot to do with your digestive system, and it's very like specific to individuals and what you eat and how you eat. And then I went from there to eating like no sugar, and then I went from there to eating vegan, and then I went from there to eating vegan raw. <laughs> and now I'm back to eat. But I, I learned something from each of them. Um, so when I was Ayurvedic, I learned that it's best to stop eating at a certain time of the night. Like I, it's really best for my body if I stop eating, say at eight o'clock at night, like two hours before bed. Because if you eat before you go to bed, all that food's just gonna sit and you know it's it's just gonna sit inside of you. It's not really being worked or used for energy at all. You know, so your digestive system's working too hard while you're sleeping, which isn't good for you. And then when I went to going sugar free. I learned that sugar actually makes me feel really gross and isn't good for my body. And then when I went vegan, I felt much better not eating dairy. Right, so I know that dairy doesn't do well for me. And then with vegan raw, that was really interesting because I, I really learned how much eating raw fruits and vegetables really is just great for us because our bodies need the nutrients, right? So like that's where we function at our best is when we have the nutrients in our body and our blood's, you know, has what it needs and everything's flowing perfectly. But that one's really hard to maintain because it's a lot of blending <laughs> and nobody eats like that. <laughs> and uh, I realized I was eating way too many nuts. Like there were nuts in everything. Like I was eating like a pound of cashews like a week and, that, and nuts are expensive. So, and they're really high in fat. So I was just like, meh. Um, so now I'm in this happy place where I am eating a lot more fruits and vegetables. Um, I am eating cooked food, which I love, and I'm eating, you know, still low on the sugar, and I don't eat past 8 o'clock at night. So there's like little bits of everything I took from each of the diets I tried to make this final way of eating that I'm at right now.
Yeah. As a panelist, if you can announce the top tip, please always say it's on the first team. Uh, but he always stays in the presentation. And I'm not on the team at all. I just sit back and look and pretend that I am in front of the group. I don't care who you are, just what. All right. Well, I don't either. I, I just want to keep doing what I'm doing. And right you already hooked up to the projector, so. But, um,
Fair enough. Okay, stop sharing for me. So, uh, this is part of the project, and this is 
Um, I did my interview with Eliza Kane and Andy George about their business, the Red Hand Sisters, and I um, recorded it. And it came out. Thank you. 
Downing about her bagel business. Uh, yeah. So we get that together and slowly I would start with me 
really want to continue with this one. And I always have like a period of time where I'm like, but I'm really looking to do this. So I never thought about doing reading or different things. Um, but I knew I didn't want to put up a road whenever it came time to do my dad and my brother. And they loved, you know, economics in there, you know, there's other schools that now for cooking and what and so and then well I got a taste for this world. So I went that route and gave myself some time to say, okay, like if I like this essay in school, I go on the road and the school or whatever from there and take a class. So I went to the class. You know, we're we're quite I was kind of being myself to be in the Like when I talked to my other friends that were in the school and other things, I was like, wow, I wasn't in school, I was going to school. They were all slacking on like what economic class was I in. I was like, oh, I have like I was in it today. That's my class because that class is really my class. And it was just kind of like I wouldn't always have that, but it was just like this is what you have to do. Everyone just like made it up on the spot, but I can't do that, so show up something. Um, okay, Marcy Lutsky is a local mom with plans to go to Wakefield Elementary. She's a recipe creator, food blogger, and a cooking class teacher. This is the story of how she used her experiences to get her kids, who were born at seven months, to eat. Please enjoy.
Uh, I decided to interview my grandfather. He worked at Kellogg's for almost 25 years. And I thought it was interesting since he created and helped create a lot of things that was added. Before everyone leaves, we have some talking to do. <laughs> so a few kids um, got together and have been working on something for the past two days for Mr. Gordon. Um, okay, would you like to come up here? Um, I'm not sure if any of you remember signing this card. 
So you guys, there's the camera. So you could actually back up onto the other side of the microphone and be on the camera a little bit. So, so everyone sign in. Back, back up more, guys. Just a little bit more so you'll be on the camera a little bit more. So, so Mr. Gordon, the, 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 I guess from the Sunshine Committee, uh, the teachers uh, got together and talked a little bit. So. That's from us. Um, you guys, do you all want to tell Mr. Gordon what, what, how you made his card, what you put in the card, since everybody else can't see it right now? Does anybody want to tell him? I know I saw it. It was a very interesting card. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers um, signing this, or I don't know if everyone did, but when Mr. Gordon was out the other day, we had people sign the card and give and give the baby game idea. So that's what's wow. in the card. My favorite is Gordon Gordon. Gordon Gordon Gordon. Can we do a time? Where are we in time? What time is it? What time? So. Okay, so guys, before you hop up and have a seat for just a moment, let's talk about. Hey guys, before you hop up, please sit back for just a second. I want to talk about what's next. A couple of things. I know, you know, thanks for your patience during as we were sort of like trying to figure out how to be live streamers. 